Welcome to the Live to 110 podcast. My name is Wendy Myers and I'm a health and nutrition coach and I'd love to introduce you to my fellow co-host Kate Bien who is also a nutrition coach. Hi, Hi. how are you Wendy? Hi, how are you? And we are broadcasting live worldwide from Malibu, California. Today I will be interviewing Carol Vanderstoep author of Mouth Matters, a fantastic book about how our oral health profoundly affects our overall health. It can't be stressed enough. And you can find her on mouthmattersbook.com. Today we're going to be talking about all kinds of hot topics in biological dentistry, including mercury amalgam fillings, the dangers of root canals, and the myofascial aspects of dental health that may surprise a lot of people, and how that relates to sleep apnea and breathing difficulties, etc. So hello Kate, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I, I was, Wendy and I were talking before about my theme ride for Soul Cycle, my spinning class, and how my neck is sore from head banging, and my hip bones are bruised from doing the worm. <laughs> oh really? You were head banging in, in Soul Cycle class? Yeah, that's right. Or you're you're teaching it rather. <laughs> yeah, head banging and teaching oh, simultaneously. Wow. <laughs> that sounds fun. Yeah. I probably would have died in that class. It sounds like. It was an hour. It was is an hour class, a little longer than usual. Well, this is probably a little bit TMI, but I have a hard time doing cycling classes or spinning classes because my JJ always gets bruised. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they have, well, the good thing about Soul Cycle is that they have gel seats to put on the, I recommend to everyone, every woman <laughs> for their first time to use one of those. I used it for actually quite some time in the beginning until I got used to it. I didn't need to use it anymore, but yeah. So you're saying you've got calluses developed on your JJ? <laughs> No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're just you're just toughened up down there. So yeah, you had to adapt. Yeah. So so Kate, why don't you do our super annoying disclaimer? Okay. Please keep in mind that the Live to 110 podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease or health condition. This podcast is solely informational in nature. Please consult your healthcare practitioner before attempting in any treatment you hear on this show. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, when was the last time that you went to a dentist, since we're on the topic of dentistry? Um, I think I went almost six months ago, so I'm probably due again. I go twice a year. I think that's how many you're supposed to go, right? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah, my dentist is always trying to get me to go every four months to get my teeth clean. I mean, I would go every four months, but my insurance doesn't cover every four months. Yeah, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, but it's like I have a, my sister-in-law is a dentist, so it makes it kind of oh, yeah. easy to go in and see her. And she's a really good dentist. She's amazing. Yeah. So I always like do that thing where, you know, I'm not really religious about flossing. I've gotten way better about it. But it's when you make that dentist appointment. It's like a week before the dentist, and then all of a sudden you like start flossing every day. It's <laughs> like. Do you want to just tell the dentist that, like, when he says, do you floss, you want to just be able to be like, yeah, I do. Like, for the last week, you leave that part out. Oh, we have a guest on the show. Uh, my daughter, Winter. Is a... <laughs> She's decided to come on the show today. Um, so, hi, Winter. How are you doing? You decided to... Oh, sorry, my nanny couldn't make it today, so... Like, last minute, trying to get the last recording done, and of course, I can't, so... Do you use a regular toothbrush for her? No, I actually use a Sonicare. For winter, you do? Yeah, I do. It's just like, you know, it's hard to... she again? She's three and a half. Okay. But, you know, for little kids, it's hard to get them to sit still to brush their teeth. And use a Sonicare, it's kind of like double time. It really, it cleans their teeth a lot faster, so it gets the job done better. Well, why don't we get on today with the show, since my daughter is uh, anxious for my attention. <laughs> okay. Our guest, Carol Vanderstoop, is a registered dental hygienist and oral facial myofunctional therapist in Austin, Texas. And she has more than three decades of clinical experience as a dental hygienist. During that time, she came to realize dentistry's marginal position in preventive medicine, which she thinks needs to be at the forefront. Hence the birth of her book, Mouth Matters. And you can find that on mouthmattersbook.com. 
Hello, Carol. Thank you for being on the show. I am so glad that you have chosen to speak with me today because as we were talking earlier, all the areas of dentistry that I talk about really have the potential to affect people's health. So the very fact that we're having this conversation means that people are waking up to that idea. So it's delightful to be here. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for coming on. And I think this is really important because I've been telling people for years that they need to go get their teeth clean and do preventive dentistry and that there's a reason health insurance companies pay to get your teeth cleaned because it is actually an important thing you have to do for your health because you know bacteria in your mouth can cause infections all over your body and heart disease and it just has profound uh, systemic effects. So uh, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and why you decided to write Mouth Matters? Well, you know, I would say that I got tired of the old paradigm that we operate from. I think all medicine is pretty much treating the symptoms of disease and not really getting to the root cause. And actually, when I started writing the book, I'd have to say that I started from that paradigm. As you said, true, uh, plaques from the mouth do enter the bloodstream and affect everything, all the inflammatory diseases. It's just one of the web, one of the diseases that's part of the web of inflammation of heart disease, stroke risk, diabetes, uh, osteoporosis, you name it. And so I did break down the book into chapters so people could really see how does uh, leaving plaque in your mouth affect heart disease. You know, I broke it down into all those different diseases and so on. But as I moved forward, I realized that it's not just about that. And I think just about, I don't care what discipline medical doctors who are thinking are coming from, they're coming to the same conclusion. It's about what we eat. Oh. So, and I know you know that, but yeah. still, um, that's equally important. Our lifestyles really make a big difference in oral health. And so I, I also go into that a great deal. Well, and one of my my you know pressing questions that I've read a lot about biological dentistry and um, you know and a lot about the biological dentistry and like you, that you shouldn't get root canals. Um, and can you explain a little bit about why dental why you shouldn't be getting root canals? Root canals are a very hot topic right now. Um, and you'll even find within the biological dental community, there are varying opinions on it. The problem with root canals are, okay, so what is a root, what is a tooth that needs a root canal? Basically what's happened is either the decay has gotten so deep that it's gotten to the center portion of the tooth that carries the blood vessels and nerves and all the lymph flow that helps to keep the tooth alive and, uh, full of the nutrients it needs to stay alive and it dies, you know, it becomes infected with bacteria and it can't survive. So the tooth itself dies, or you can have gum disease so badly that it's blown away enough bone around the outside of the tooth that the germs enter from underneath the tooth. Either way, the pulp is dead. So the old way of looking at it was to remove the pulp that's dead and basically embalm the tooth. We're in dentistry about the only profession I can think of that tries to keep something dead within the body just so it can continue functioning on some level. I, I personally think that's a bad decision uh, because you, first of all, the pulp that brings the nutrients is never as straight and simple as what the drawings look like. Quite often they're braided, there are ancillary canals and so on. On top of that, there are miles and miles of these microtubules. So going back to an alive tooth, again, you know, the lymph and the blood vessels and everything come up through the base of the tooth, through this huge pulp, and then out through these miles and miles of tubules to kind of keep the tooth flushed and clean and, and with the nutrients it needs. So. What they want to do is to go ahead, or what most dentists do that do root canals, they'll come in through the top of the tooth, they'll get the pulp out, and then they'll have various ways they try and clean out the canal the best they can, and then they seal it up. Uh, you know, the old 
probably the oldest way to fill it was with a silver point. That might have been the best thing of all because we all know that silver is antibacterial, but it doesn't, I don't know whether it works on funguses and, and yeast and things. But, but again, it's such a straight point that it doesn't really fill the canal all that well. And then you have gutta percha, which shrinks and expands, and uh, that isn't a very acceptable material either. And the very fact of the matter is, is that they'll seal the top of the tooth and they can seal the bottom of the tooth, but what happens to all those miles of tubules that end out at the surface of the tooth? And by the way, like a front tooth has three miles of tubules, probably a back tooth has double that. That's a lot of space. And you have to realize that the bacteria that were part of the tooth dying in the first place migrate into these tubules and there's no way to kill that. Until the advent of ozone, um, ozone therapy would be the most successful way to make a root canal tooth work, I suppose, because it can diffuse through those tubules and, and kill the germs, but, but you can't seal all those tubules and so you still have the remaining question as to whether that tooth is going to stay sterile over time. My experience is that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting. Also, also once you have something dead in the body, I think more and more people are starting to understand energy medicine. Energetically, it's dead. You know, it, it, it blocks meridians. And so you have that problem too. So most biological dentists that I know would probably go ahead and extract the tooth. Okay, so can you extract the tooth and then do ozone to kill all the bacteria? And there again, that's an excellent question. Um, on my website is, if you punch in root canal roulette, you'll come up with uh, pictures that kind of help ex describe what I'm talking about. But Yes, if you don't extract a tooth correctly, I don't care if it's a live tooth extracted for, I don't know, orthodontic reasons, which let that's a whole other can of worms, um, or, or something because it's necrotic, you have to take care of the infection there or you'll get a cavitation. That's another hotly contested subject within dentistry. Uh, most dentists would say there's no such thing as a cavitation, which means it's a, a cavitation is where there's an area of dead bone that healed over with healthy bone, but you have all these bad bacteria trapped and so on. And the same thing as a root canal. These things can filter in through, through your blood supply and, and taint the rest of your body. But anyway, when you pull these out, uh, Hal Huggins has an amazing DNA test that you can do. People want to know if some of the bugs that were in a root canal or a cavitation are leading to some of the are associated with some of the other medical problems that they're having. And so they'll ask for a DNA test from Dr. Huggins' lab. He tests, I don't know, 128, 165, I don't remember, different bacteria. I uh, have a good friend who has a very, very healthy lifestyle, very clean. And he had an, uh, a root canal, a failed root canal tooth removed, and we did that. And, and you just wouldn't believe what came back. He was in New York during... 9-11 and I mean I think they even found anthrax in there and they found uh, um, gonorrhea they found um, all kinds of crazy little bugs I mean uh, two columns tightly spaced of germs that are in there so I don't think that you have a choice but to really clean out the old necrotic bone take about a millimeter of bone out from the socket and then hit it with ozone in an attempt to really get that clean and then so then you have to um sorry i'm hearing some reflection but so then you have to uh i guess put an implant in is that your other option that to is one the option. um and again biological dentistry you have a lot of different theories involved in that energetically again it's kind of like a root canal tooth you know an embalmed tooth it doesn't really you know it blocks meridians and then there are two kinds of root canal, I mean, two kinds of implants. There are titanium implants, and then there are the zirconia implants. Titanium implants have much the same problem as joint replacements in other parts of the body. I think it's beginning to be recognized that metal on metal, you know, for instance, you break off little flecks and the body has to deal with the titanium. 
you still have that with a titanium implant. Um, so there's that issue. And then, of course, titanium isn't as harm, harmless as a lot of people would say. Uh, the titanium implants tend to depress T cells, which are one of the immune system's ways of helping us take care of infection. So a lot of people who have implants, let's just say that they have suppressed immune systems. A lot of them get some autoimmune disorders. Cancer is a possibility once you, cancer's an interesting one. If if your immune system is really good, I mean, everybody's forming cancer cells all the time, and we're hoping that our lifestyle is good enough to take care of these cells that want to proliferate. If you start putting in things like mercury and titanium and things like that, then you're just suppressing your immune system and not allowing it to function in, it's in an optimal way. So then some of these bad cells get away from us and, and start turning into cancers and so on. Yeah, I know when I've had a root, I, I have a root canal myself when I was 12, I ate it on the pavement and half my, my tooth came off and so it eventually died. And um, when I was about 20, the tooth died. And so basically, you know, they had to clean it out and I've had to have it redone a couple times since then. And every time they take off the tooth, that you can just smell the bacteria. It's frightening. <laughs> it it is. is, and it's unfortunate. You've, you've just brought up the most difficult of all because I'm pretty sure it would be a front tooth. You have yes. a lovely smile, but what do you do for a front tooth? That's, you know, I can't say for sure what I would do, but um, I'm leaning more and more towards extracting. You know, I, I just, I can't imagine what's in there. And mm -hmm. you can do a bridge also, right? There are, yes, you can do a bridge. There are problems with bridges too. Here's yes. the thing. Once you start having a problem, then you have to start making hard choices because nothing is good as the original. So you have to kind of get your priorities in line and take it from there. Uh, as a good example, I'm wearing braces right now. I never thought I would go into them. but And I don't like braces because there's a lot of nickel in them. And then, of course, the metal's crossing the midline, which, again, messes with your meridians. Um, but my choice was to do them anyway because the alternative was worse. I have a small airway, and I needed to expand my mouth in order to have more room for my tongue so that I would have more of a chance of not having apnea when I get older. So I had to make that choice, and I was willing to go into braces for a year to do that. That's not nearly as hard a decision as whether to have a root canal or an implant in my body. But yeah, we have to start making those decisions, even even to whether we're going to have a crown. Uh, if you listen to my Mercola interview, I talked about how I really hate how that is so invasive. It has to take off 60% of the tooth for the most part to put a, what's essentially a cap over the tooth. And then all of a sudden it is not putting the compressive forces that teeth have to put up with, it is unable to transmit them to the root as well as the original tooth. So the tooth has a lot of breakage and a, a lot of times those will just break off at the gum line or you know, something like that. A lot of people grit their teeth. Yeah, I they, do, I, I love doing that. You do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really bad. You're less likely to be clenching on the front teeth and certainly not as hard as on the back teeth. We see the breaking off more often on the back teeth because you have to put up with so many hundreds more pounds per square inch when you do that. But when we clench, the tooth uh, flexes a bit and you'll start seeing these little V-shaped notches in the right at the edge of the crown or even in a regular tooth, you'll see that too. And it's just worse than than having your regular tooth if you have a crown on it because then all the forces have to be passed around the outside of the tooth and concentrated right there at the gum line. So, Well, let, let's talk a little bit about mercury fillings. Um, this is like a huge, huge debate in the, the dental, dental world and 
I've, I can't even tell you how many dentists um, I've had tell me that mercury is totally safe, it's completely fine. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? <laughs> and so do you think that mercury amalgam fillings are toxic and should people have them removed? Well, the stand that the American Dental Association is taking is becoming less and less credible all the time. At some point, they need to go, okay, we just can't make up any more stuff that sounds reasonable. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not a belief system. Back in 1980, I believe the Germans showed that unequivocally mercury vapor is emitted from these fillings. So the ADA said, well, yeah, but it's not much. It's not enough to do any damage. Well, mercury is actually one of those heavy metals that there's, there should be a zero tolerance level. I mean, we're already picking it up from fish and, and coal burning plants and so on. Having it right in your mouth being emitted is, is um, it seems to be an untenable attitude. But, and, and you know, let me just say, this is a very, very difficult subject. When I started writing my book, of course, I was on firm ground talking about all the inflammatory diseases and how they were connected. But, you know, sooner or later, I had to look at mercury and fluoride, which I hadn't done before. And it was the hardest thing I did in my life because I had parroted what I'd heard from dental school and so on, even though I kind of knew that that was not right. And now with the Internet, there's just no excuse for not understanding it. Um, and in fact... I kept wondering for the past seven years maybe when somebody would be brave enough to get on the television with a Jerome Mercury analyzer because there's that's just what they use in industry to see what kind of vapor that workers are exposed to. And to his credit, Dr. Oz was the first person to do it. And perhaps many of your listeners have seen that. It's really kind of a beautiful piece. And it's also especially nice because I remember – getting his book, You Staying Younger, years ago. Um, I thought he was beating me to the punch on the book on oral systemic health. He did have a, a whole chapter on oral systemic medicine. And interestingly, he talked a little bit about fluoride toxicity in a very light manner. He just said, it's possible we're getting too much in a sidebar. But then on another sidebar, he says, mercury is completely safe. So I'm really, really proud of him for studying that and bring it to the fore and if you haven't seen that probably you should or just punch in smoking tooth to see how much mercury is emitted i of course talk about it a lot in my book but what was interesting was of course then the ada had to come back and have some sort of a statement well first of all they severed all ties with him i'm not sure how serious the ties were in the first place but they made a big deal of severing those ties but also they made a point that Whatever mercury does come out of the fillings, whatever vapor does is, I don't know, inactivated by the proteins in the saliva or something. And I thought that was such an odd thing to say. And then they moved on immediately with another statement, kind of on another subject. And then I thought, well, I don't know. To tell you the truth, I'm not much of a drooler. You know, I try to keep my saliva in my mouth. What do I do with it? I swallow it. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. okay, so if it goes into saliva, what then? It's in your body. And anyway, then I pulled up a study, I think two or three days ago. This is Mercury um, Awareness Week, so Dr. Mercola has a lot on it. And I made a little comment with a link to a study that shows that, anyway, 65% does go past the saliva into the vapor does go into you know, the oral cavity, and then you respire it and so on. But more interestingly, you know, for a while they were making the argument, well, the kind of mercury they put in these fillings is elemental mercury. It's not the bad methyl mercury. But guess what? There are germs in the mouth and in the stomach that immediately methylate it, so that argument is moot too. Anyway, we're, uh, my point with Dr. Mercola even was that Mercury fillings, the, the design that's required, it breaks teeth apart in the first place. And then you have these fillings that have a different expansion rate than the tooth itself. So eventually the tooth is going to break apart. If you have very many listeners out there with amalgam fillings in them, the silver, dark, ugly looking things, mm, 
almost all people out there that have one of those, if they've had them long enough, will have experienced a cusp breaking off or part of the tooth breaking away. And they never think it's the fault of the amalgam. They just think it has to do with them. But really, it's the, the physics of the whole situation. They, they pretty much guarantee that the tooth will break down. So they may be cheaper to put in, but in the long run, you end up spending so much more. And in fact, that brings up a conversation I had with a Canadian dentist uh, this past weekend. She is working three days a week in a practice that is not her own in an area where there is a army base or something, one of the military bases. And of course, that's all they allow put in, being put in because they're cheap. And she's good at it. She says, I love putting in these mercury fillings or she called them amalgam fillings because they're easy to carve. They're fun. She likes it. And then she paused for a minute and she said, but I know that I have to stop doing it sooner or later. I'm starting to have neurological problems. Mm, <laughs> so, wow. Okay. So that gave me a great opportunity to say, um, well, you know, perhaps you can't really change that, but you can make these little changes and people will start questioning. You know, if you put on in a uh, negative ion generator in the office to pick up the mercury, if you start wearing a mask, such as people wear like a gas mask so that you're not picking it up, um, if you start using a heavy vacuum, you know, taking all the precautions that you should when you're taking out these toxic materials, which really generates a lot of vaporized mercury, you know, it's not a big surprise if your patients will start asking you, why are you doing these things? What's going on? And, and you could just say, well, I'm starting to have neurological problems from working with this material. And, you know, however you want to say it, start raising the awareness. And I would imagine that a lot of the clients would start saying, oh, ooh, so what are the options? So Yeah, I think it's, that's a really interesting point that your associate ha started having neurological problems because dentistry of all professions has the highest suicide rate. And so yes, I wonder if that has anything to do with it. <laughs> For many reasons. And most of the biological dentists I know actually got into it from the mercury issue. They know that they're, they're in it day in and day out. And this whole thing about, oh, oh, these dentists are just taking out good, good fillings so that they can make a lot of money by putting in these other ones. And I would say that would, not be a very good argument because when you drill out a filling, you're really producing an awful lot of mercury and they're breathing it. They're right in the face. And by the way, dental assistants have one of the highest um, uh, miscarriage rates and so on. They, uh, of any working professional, we haven't looked at that and, and that's terrible. I know, I know several people, hygienists and assistants alike, personally, throughout the years that have not been able to hold on to their, you know, to their fetuses. And one would imagine that that would have a lot to do with it. Well, that's really so, sad. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. As I do hair mineral analysis, and every single person has mercury toxicity. Um, and my mentor that trained me, Dr. L. Wilson, he's given 30,000 hair tests and he said every single person has mercury toxicity. So, you know, people just have to realize that no, no matter what the entry point into your body, be it fillings or in the air from coal burning plants, it is causing toxicity and problems in our bodies. Absolutely. And one of the biggest things... Uh, that it does is creates a lot of oxidation. Our cells can't work at a very good level. And, I mean, energy metabolism, look at the people with trouble with fatigue and so on. And you finally reach a tipping point. I mean, you commonly hear, well, um, I don't see people growing horns. I don't see, you know, all these ridiculous comments. But these are very subtle toxicities that you want to, you know, you get to a tipping point and then you have disease, but it's so far removed from the initial problem that of course you can't put a direct tie to it. But yeah, I'm sure most of us are mercury toxic. I haven't even looked at mine, but I, I work at chelating and taking carbon and chlorella and so on all the time because I'm still facing it. I mean, I get tired of even people who have all these fillings and they'll open their mouth and it emits a lot right into my face. And a long time ago I quit polishing, but even polishing 
you would think hygienists would care more because a lot of times they're set to polishing and making these things look lovely, but they're liberating a lot of mercury and doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, well, I'm happy to put you on a nutritional balancing program to detox <laughs> at cost, if you'd like. Oh, so, that'd so, be fun. We'll it's a very effective program. It, it completely detoxes your body. It involves infrared saunas and things like that, but it's, it's oh, very yes. effective. You said it does involve infrared saunas. Yes, it does, yes. Excellent. Yeah. yeah those, are, those are amazing, aren't they? Oh, yeah. I love them. I love my home one. And so I had another question. Um, I recently went to the dentist, and I had all my mercury fillings removed about you know 20 years ago. But at that time, I had no idea about biological dentistry. I just, I just intuitively knew that the mercury shouldn't be in my mouth. So I just went to the dentist and said, replace all my fillings. And lo and behold, I went to my sister-in-law, who's a dentist. She's an amazing dentist. She's not biological, but she's pretty close. She's very cutting edge. And so she removed um, a couple of my fillings to redo them. And there was mercury underneath. Oh gosh! Yes. And so I guess he hadn't. The guy didn't remove all of it. I guess he just was doing it for cosmetic. He thought I was doing it for cosmetic reasons, and just removed as much as he needed to to put in the uh, the composite. So it, can that cause problems? The mercury that's yes. sitting yes. on the root. Yeah, I, I think that it should all be removed. Don't forget. Uh, back to those little tubules. It's interesting. You know, we have a world that's there's as much sugar as you want to eat, and when a person eats sugar, one of the small little downsides of it is the natural flow, the cleansing flow that goes through a tooth, it reverses direction. So whatever's in the tooth goes into the pulp and then into the body. So if you had mercury in there, uh, it was going, it was being transmitted to the pulp and then out through your body every time you had sugar, for instance. Um, so yeah, no, you should always, you should always have all the amalgam removed. Uh, a lot of times, what I think they were leaving it in for is they didn't want to drill into yet more tooth structure. Because true, the more tooth you remove, the worse it is. But what you also almost always find when you take out all the amalgam is that there is some decay underneath it. Yeah. So, And I'm not much into drills anyway. If you listen to my broadcast with Dr. Mercola, you know, I, I like to back it up, back it up, back it up, back it up. For our children... We absolutely should not just be using x-rays and a pick to be diagnosing decay. Um, it, it just doesn't work. It's, not, it's, it's, it's the guessing method of decay. Uh, that's probably a worthwhile interview to listen to. I also have a little bit on my website about it. But basically, on those principles, both of my daughters looked absolutely pristine. There, there was no stain in the little grooves on the top part of their teeth. It wasn't able to be, nothing was picked up on an x-ray. The little picks showed nothing. But I was looking at my oldest daughter and based on the information that I give in that Mercola interview, I just said, I don't believe it. And I went into my doc's room and picked up an air abrasion unit and just opened up all the grooves a little bit. It's not what I wanted to do. It's not the best way you should use a special imaging device, but it's what I had available. And sure enough, one of the little grooves opened up into a stain and the stain got bigger and bigger the deeper I went. And that little prep went almost all the way to the pulp and and that's when it was time to stop looking to see how deep that little hole went and to use some ozone on it and we kept that little prep if you will open for months and I applied ozone to it for several minutes every month and we'll talk about that in a bit but eventually we filled it in but I even took a picture of that to see how close to the pulp it was, and the x-ray showed nothing on there, not even the prep. So uh, I know you're going to probably ask me about fluoride here in a minute, of whether it's a good idea to remineralize and so on. And the thing is, is that fluoride has so mineralized the upper la level of teeth, layer of teeth, that x-rays do not shoot through the tooth the same way, and Decay has to get significantly into the next layer before we can even pick it up and diagnosis, diagnose it. And in my book, I go into three ways that we actually decay from the inside out anyway, so that remineralizing a tooth from the outside just makes less and less sense to me. 
Yeah, that's really interesting, and I think that's really why I wanted to have you on the show is to talk about prevention and what we need to be doing to prevent decay in the first place. And what can be done? Like you talk about ozone in your book, which I frankly have never heard about prior to hearing your interview with Dr. McCullough. And can you explain a few of the benefits of using ozone and maybe some other ways how we can prevent uh, tooth decay? Yes. Uh, basically, probably, again, going back to diet, the best way is to have a really clean diet. And most of my patients and probably a lot of your listeners know it. But I will say the toughest thing for most people to do, I mean, they'll eat grass-fed beef, they'll eat lots of vegetables, they'll do all kinds of things, but then they'll get that sheepish look and say, but I'm still addicted to sugar. So that's me, that's me. I hate well, to admit it. sweetie, have you read my book? <laughs> I've read parts of it, yes. You have got to get off the sugars. I, know. I can't think of anything more devastating to your body in every single way. For instance, let's look at what dentistry does to try to fight all of this. Uh, everywhere you look, kills germs, kills germs, kills germs. Well, actually, as with in many places in our body, there are lots of good germs. We don't want to kill everything. You know, we have this very, probably 80% of our immune system is in our gut, and it has to do with the bacteria that are there. Every time we eat sugar, we, we weaken that a little bit because it kills off the probiotics that are in our gut, the good bacteria. That's reason enough. And when I say sugar, I mean wheat too, because wheat pretty much turns immediately into sugar. So it, it, we're constantly abusing the wonderful flora, bacterial flora that we got in the first place by eating sugars. And that's a, that's the toughest thing I fight because it was hard for me because I never was addicted to sugars, and I actually wrote the whole first edition not realizing how big of an addiction it is for people. But I caught on to it pretty fast, and I highly recommend maybe Dr. Amon's book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Body. And I'd even go to his website and look what happens to your brain. I mean, it looks like a shriveled up old raisin, you know, if you're not doing it right, as opposed to a nice fat, you know, grape. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, but he, I mean, there are five different neuro uh, chemical ways that we're addicted to sugars. And you, you get to identify which way you're addicted to it. And then it's really easy to change. Probably 60% of the people out there are addicted to sugars um, in the same way that, uh, alcoholics are addicted to their alcohol. Um, it's the very same addiction pathway. And I happen to know that my daughter, for instance, had that particular addiction pathway, or at least I guessed it. And so we fought it. It's actually the easiest one to fight. All she had to do was take uh, a really high quality whey protein. And boy, that's the trick, really high quality mm. grass fed, you know, cool produced, something like One World Way. There's some other ones out there, but um, two scoops every morning before the day started. You have to get protein into your brain anyway. And um, after two or three weeks, she could have cared less about sugar and it didn't taste the same. It's a little disappointing to realize that it doesn't taste the same because it's a comfort food, but it's also a huge relief because I can't think of anyone out there who really knows that it's good for you you know i mean yeah. we all know it's not good for yes us. yeah so i'm just going to mention that for your clients because because they have to know that they that it is an addiction it's not something they can usually set their mind to and get over it so. yeah i mean i've been trying to fight it for years and i just i have not been successful and so I'm, I'm going to try that tip. I've read Dr. Amen's book too, and I want to get one of his brain scans, but they're like five or $6,000. So I'm going to be waiting on that for you a little know, bit. And what would you do with that brain scan anyway? You'd either confirm or deny that, that you have a problem and, 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 and you're going to do the same. Well, you'll either be comfortable and keep going and doing what you're doing or you'll change, which is, you know, you want to change, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I'm guessing. So, so. Yeah, that's a tough one. But it just unbalances the chemistry in your mouth. You know, your whole body is going to run acid being on sugars. And it's it's very, I mean, all disease states exist when, when you're not having a balanced body chemistry. So that's really the first line of defense. But that being said, 
preventive in dentistry. So the little grooves on the top of the teeth are the most difficult and common decay to have because even at eruption time, the, there can be a little crack in the bottom of that groove and you can't access it with a toothbrush. So it's, it's more than likely going to decay. And you just can't tell what's going on. The only way you can guide that is by zero, having zero sugar or this or that, but I'm not even sure then that that would protect that group. So diagnosis is of paramount importance. You have to go to someone who has some sort of a little air abrasion method of cleaning out the grooves of the tooth and then something like a diagnodent. And actually I was taught, I, I need to have this conversation with a, a new dentist that I met up in New York. Um, I'm thrilled to death. He does air abrasion, biomimetic, ozone dentistry, and he does it biologically. That's an almost never seen combination. Um, so he's, he was mentioned in an email that he's got a new imaging device that's coming out that will be better than x-rays, so I can't wait to hear what that is. But at any rate, X-rays and a pick don't do it. You have to have some sort of imaging device. The other child I took to a dentist in San Antonio about three weeks ago, and even though her teeth looked pristine, she had five little tiny cavities, and they were able to get to them before they got too deep. I mean, that's the key. The more tooth structure you take out, the more likely it's going to break down later, and you end up with this endless cycle of repair and breakdown. And, and the less you have to enter that, the better. So that's a good reason why people ought to be going to the dentist fairly frequently. Um, a lot of people are afraid to go, I think, but if you can find a dentist who can do that. And I have a database on my website. Now, I'll say that all those dentists on my website, uh, I have three little categories. Air abrasion dentistry, biomimetic, which means copying the structure of the tooth as closely as you can so it can pass those compressive forces through the tooth to the root and not break down over a lifetime, and then ozone. But I kind of left off that biological component because, first of all, that's a very broad subject, and everybody interprets it a little bit differently, and I didn't really know how I could quantify that, but a lot of those dentists don't have the vaguest idea about mercury or fluoride toxicity or any of the biological ideas that I think are important. And and that's what gets down to the bottom of what it's all about. It's every single person taking responsibility for what it is they want, prioritizing what they want, and then asking their dentist for what it is that they want. The more they hear about it from people where they're making their bread and butter, the more pressure there is going to be to change. And that's where all the power is. We've got to vote with our pocketbooks. I'd, I'd be willing to, and I do, fly across the country for the kind of dentistry that I want because I value it and I understand it and I know how important it is to do it right. Well, let's talk a little bit about ozone. You've kind of touched on it a little bit. What um, what are, you know, other uses, sorry. Yeah, what are some of, what are the other uses and the benefits of using ozone, and where can you find a dentist that uses ozone? Yeah, so my database on ozone is incomplete. There are um, other databases, too, and you, you do have to look for it, and more and more are coming online all the time. The beauty of it is uh, multifold. First of all, it does kill all microbes, and that is wonderful because we do deal with some rather terrible germs in the mouth. And I know I just said that we don't want to kill everything, but what it also does is set up this wonderful environment for the good bacteria to proliferate. It's a more alkaline environment so and aerobic environment. So in the presence of oxygen, you have good, good bacteria populating the mouth, and then they can kind of keep out the bad ones. So it sets up that wonderful environment. It kills all the bad ones, and... So I kind of intimated a little bit about how it's used in decay. You don't even have to remove a lot of the tooth structure. You can remove most of it. You get down to what we call the leathery layer, and then you can just hit it with ozone, and that ozone will penetrate deep into the tooth, at least two to five millimeters. And remember those tubules I was talking about with root canals? It can kill everything that's in there and change the chemistry within the tooth. That's the important thing because our bodies are set to heal themselves. 
if you have a nerve that's alive, then it's going to be bringing the minerals to the tooth to remineralize that. Just as my daughter had that happen and that, that decay that I hadn't removed turned hard over time, that is what happens. So that's wonderful. That's one, one use for it. So it halts or reverses decay. When I use it in gum disease, I'm killing all those nasty germs that are deep under the gums, and a lot of people don't know that there are germs under their gums that they have to remove. I would refer them to my Facebook page or my website, um, www.mouthmattersbook.com, and I have a, it was quickly put together, but you can get what you need from it, uh, to show them how to get up under the gums to clean, because that's critical. So you can kill all the germs up under the gums. And then if you've had gum disease where you didn't know to clean under the gums and those germs have gotten deeper than what you can clean, you need the tissues to reattach to the tooth. And it does that. I call it kind of a Velcro-like attachment. The little hooks we call fibroblasts, and it allows them to proliferate like crazy. And so they'll definitely want to hook back onto the tooth so it can help reduce pockets. There are a lot of people who are on, oh, I don't know, about 700 of the different drugs that cause dry mouths. So they're particularly prone to yeast infections. A dry mouth is devastating as far as cavities are concerned. They ought to have some ozone trays made so that the ozone can help keep their teeth strong and their gums strong. But if, if yeast infection gets away from them, they can even use these ozonated oils that you can buy. I've got one on my website available, but that was mainly just to let people know what they can buy. I like that one because it's jojoba oil. It doesn't taste so bad as say the um, uh, olive oil that a lot of people will oxygenate or, you know, ozonate. But it's a way for the common person who doesn't have access to an ozone machine to get ozone into their mouths. It doesn't have the penetrating power. It can't halt or reverse cavities, but it sure is great for gum disease. And so also if you, so if you have a denture or a dry mouth and you think you have a candida infection, you just put some of this ozonated oil on it. Not very tasty, but you know, it's a, excuse me, a very cheap way to get rid of that infection. That's really interesting. I'd never heard of ozonated oil before. I mean, is that something that you can use on a daily basis for prevention or is it just for disease? Actually, I do in braces because I'm so paranoid. Um, I put it on these little picks that uh, Butler Gum makes, G-U-M, and they're little tiny picks and I'll pull a little bit out and put it on and just put it in between my teeth. It's, again, it's on, the, it's on the video. You can use a rubber tip if, if it isn't going to work in that particular kind of area, but that's nice. Um, Also, I mean, it has a lot of uses. My girls use it on, you know, little blemishes that might come out from time to time on their face. I use it on ant bites and chiggers. And I had a couple of ladies take it to the coast. They got some, uh, what do you call it, Portuguese man of war stings. And it, it slows down nerve transduction. So it takes away pain. I mean, one time I bit my tongue in a it was it was very painful to swallow. So I finally put that on there and pain went away and you know, it healed up right away. So you can also use the ozonated, if you can find a doctor who has an ozone generator and you have a herpetic infection, a cold sore, as it's coming on and they apply that, first of all, it'll usually go away a lot faster, but it has the tendency to make them never come back. 65% of the time, those cold sores never come back. So that's a really nice thing. Well, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, talk about in your book, you talk about myofacial aspects of dental health, you know, including airway development, breathing and facial development. Can you explain this aspect of your work a little bit? That is probably the most important thing that I think I talk about, and it can't be emphasized enough. I want to take it again back to the little kids because that's where the greatest hope is. Let's just say that oral posture has the ability to change how your face is developing. If you think about what braces are, it's gentle light pressure over time has the power to move in any direction an orthodontist so chooses the teeth. Well, the tongue and the cheeks and lips, 
they all have that same ability. So when we start with the littlest kids, I can't emphasize enough that if they have the correct oral posture from birth, they will probably develop with enough tongue space. They will develop horizontally forward instead of vertically. Now let me explain that a little bit. We give our children quite often pacifiers, bottles, and so on, and these teach a tongue down rest position. The nipple has to go on top of the tongue, and somehow they learn that that is what is supposed to happen, and they never revert to that tongue being plastered to the roof of the mouth as it should be. Uh, babies who breastfeed exclusively for the most part, learn that correctly. That's not to say that that's a hard and fast rule, but um, I know that a lot of working mothers, and it's very, very difficult to think that pumping and then giving it to them in a bottle is having a detrimental effect because they're going to a lot of trouble, but the patterns of lip, cheek, and tongue and swallow movements are entirely different from a bottle. So that's kind of the etiology of it people can do what they can but in the earliest years if you see that your child does not rest their tongue on the roof of the mouth and where the tip of the tongue should okay so all your listeners should take just a second and just notice this is not something anybody thinks about where is your tongue right now is it resting on the floor of your mouth is it touching your front teeth is it the lower front teeth is it the upper front teeth or is it on the roof of the mouth and if it's on the roof of the mouth, that's correct. The tip should be about a half an inch back from that front teeth. And the rest of the tongue should follow. And when you swallow, it should stay up there. A lot of people have a reverse swallow, which means that the tongue pushes forward on those teeth. And then they should have a lip seal. The biggest thing to be sure to do for your children is make sure that you've taken care of all their allergies so that they're not clogged up in their noses. They the nose is on the face for a reason. If they don't breathe through their nose, then they're going to probably have an open mouth because they'll be breathing through their mouth and their tongue will be down because you can't really draw air in through a tongue that's up. And what will happen is the front of their face will grow very, very, very long and narrow. And the jawline, which is most beautiful if it's chiseled, right, and it comes horizontally to the floor will start to drop at a sharper and sharper angle and the more it does that the less room they're going to have for their molars their bicuspids their and they also start contracting if their tongue is down they start contracting in the other direction you know from side to side so all these children with crowded teeth it's usually because they don't have um, a lip seal and the proper tongue rest position and very likely they don't swallow correctly well, wow, that's really, really interesting. I'm, I definitely heard some concepts from Weston A. Price that if you know if a child is growing in utero and they're not fed grass-fed meats and other things that their skulls are not going to form properly. But I had no idea that it was also from you know perhaps lack of breastfeeding and and the other issues that you talked about. It's highly related, and it's all over to where faces with kind of that. Oh, well, with a recessive jaw, you know, look at all the guys who are growing goatee and yeah, goatees and beards and stuff. They're often trying to hide a recessed jaw. And a lot of times they are mouth breathers. And, and to be honest, now, while most of the problems happen in, in a, at a young age, while they're still pretty plastic, that jaw will continue to, the face will continue to lengthen and become more receded over time, so throughout the life. And it's, it's terrible because it makes for a very, very tiny airway. Um, I was just at an orthopedic, uh, orthodontic conference, orthotropic, excuse me, orthodontic conference this last weekend. And I mean, I knew all this stuff, but to actually see x-rays of what, can be done to make and keep a large airway compared to doing it incorrectly, it's crazy. Um, you can have, your airway should be about 20 millimeters. That is pretty big. That's about as big as a garden hose. Mine is about six millimeters or the size of a soda straw, which is significantly less, but it's still doable. But thankfully I didn't have extraction, retraction, orthodontics, meaning they didn't 
try to straighten my teeth by pulling teeth and pulling back on everything, making less room for the tongue. And it isn't just tongue space. It's, it's a lot of how the bones form back there. But seeing the airways, it, it's all about the airway. If you don't have an airway, you don't have health, period. And um, so you have to actually have a lot of children with apnea. Most of them, uh, their parents don't have any idea that they have it. And that relates to heart disease. Even snoring just relates to heart disease. So, uh, so what a uh, oral facial myofunctional therapist can help children learn the correct oral posture. These are neuromuscular patterns that are hard to develop, but little children learn them very, very quickly. So we're there to help children who haven't attained those skills. And it's really actually a lot of fun. Best to do it by ages eight or nine, but I work on children up to 12, of course, and, and actually beyond. But but 12 is when 90% of our facial growth is done. So, and, and for those who think that their children are not developing correctly, I can't recommend this orthotropic orthodontics any more highly than I do. They should go to facefocus.com to see how how he does it, but they have to be still having a mixed dentition. They can't have all adult teeth, but he's a genius in being able to encourage that forward growth that not only is more beautiful, but much more functional. And people these days really care about aesthetics. You know, I could talk forever about airway, and it's like, oh, that's on down the line. But high cheekbones, hollowed out cheeks, nice fat full lips, you know, all these things make for an attractive face. It just also happens that they're also far more functional. So. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. Thanks for giving us that that aspect of dental health that most people have never heard of or wouldn't even be thinking of to address with their dentist. Um, but so you're not going to be able to address this with any dentist, obviously. I mean, do biological dentists address this or is this just a real specialized... Niche. It is still too too small, you know. I, to be honest, at the end of Dr. Mercola's interview, he had mentioned something that made me look in his mouth um, just to check one thing, and he turned out to have a tongue tie. So, yeah, most dentists don't look for that tongue tie. You know, his was so acute that he couldn't have an upper tongue rest position. So there was this whole slew of physical difficulties that he was addressing in other ways that were actually tied to that so for if for instance if you have um if you have a lower tongue rest posture and a tiny airway you're going to have a forward head posture and your head will come forward and your head will tilt back so you can even breathe look around and see how many people do that that's what i do that's exactly what i do my physical therapist is trying to tell me to put it back but I yeah, obviously so developed yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, you can't because it makes the airway smaller. But it's terrible for brain function. It's terrible on your, you know, cervical vertebra. It's it's much deeper than that. And, and those are the people who are going to really catch on to this uh, because, again, it's all about the airway. But don't isn't your whole neck and shoulder girdle just miserable? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and and I have I think a link on my website a young lady who had her tongue tie released she's also seeing Dr. Hang in California which is where I fly to for my orthodontics and she just can't stop talking about how wonderful how everything felt so released when she had that tongue released if you look and see how complicated all the neck and shoulder muscles are and, and how they integrate together if you've got something just pulling on it all the time then yeah, you're going to be in pain. So yeah, it's a, a very complex subject. What is the dentist that you go to in California? The orthodontist that I am working with is Dr. William Hang, and he's he's uh, he's amazing. And again, we're working on my airway, trying to make it bigger, and then I do my functional therapy to change the muscles. Back to that. So you take somebody with apnea who's older. 40% of people with mild to moderate sleep apnea don't need anything anymore once they do myofunctional therapy, if they'll actually go through. I mean, our muscles get flaccid. Even a tongue that sits on the floor of the mouth is going to be a lot more flaccid because it's not working hard enough. It's not exercising. So we help these clients learn to move and, and widen these airways the best that they can. And, and it can be very effective. So, yeah, I highly recommend before you do any other kind of 
as he said, it was rather clever. He said, all orthodontic uh, practitioners should give an airway impact assessment to their clients before they do anything. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that would be something. Because most of the time what they're doing is, is making for a smaller airway. And, yeah. and um, it's, it's unfortunate. I mean, I know these people are working really, really, really hard, but it is so hard to change an industry. So you just start with where you can. Yeah, I think the sleep apnea thing that you talked about is really important because my own father had really bad sleep apnea. He had a sleep study. He was waking up 70 times during the night, and it destroyed his health completely. Absolutely, he, in every way. Yeah, he was falling asleep during the day. You know, obviously you, you, your body and your brain can't recover. You burn, you kill millions and millions of brain cells. He was falling asleep at work. He got fired from his job, and it causes heart disease, and it just really sent him on a spiral towards his early grave. So yes. this has a profound impact on people's health. And I had no idea that you could correct this with myofascial therapy. Well, you know, but it's still very late stage. And a lot yeah. of times you do have to do more. Um, and that's, I mean, this is honestly a several hour show just to talk about yeah, that. I know. <laughs> but, um, but there are things to be done. And that's why I guess I want to emphasize with the little children because, you know, working on older people who have already lost their jobs and whose health is already failing, that's just not fishing far upstream enough. You know, we can help them, but that's practically every person I point to. Once I became aware of it, every patient that came in as, I mean, I'm still a dental hygienist and I look at their throats and I look at their facial features and it just, it breaks my heart. I couldn't fix all of them if I tried. And, um, you know, and I want to try. There are not a, enough of us out there. So, uh, and, and then, of course, okay, so let's just talk for a second about um, what dentists are doing to help with sleep apnea. I mean, they're, they're all, so a lot of dentists now are noticing when people have clenching issues and they're breaking their teeth down. And we didn't even get into bisphosphonates, you know, the, the drug that kills bone to save it, so to speak. Um, it's, it's, it's devastating to the bone and the teeth itself, but people clench their teeth to basically keep their jaw from falling back on the airway and bringing the t their tongue with it. Okay, so a lot of dentists will make just a simple splint, but if they make a simple splint and the person has apnea, then the jaw will fall back on the airway even more easily and, and uh, obscure it. So then you have the dentist who will make a double splint. It'll be one on the top and one on the bottom, and it'll push in one way or another and bring the lower jaw out and bring the tongue with it. And that's very workable, except over time, maybe a period of 15 years, you eventually do push back hard enough on those upper teeth that you change the relationship of the teeth and the jaws with each other, and they still end up with smaller tongue space. So while they're very helpful for people, I mean, I had a lady who was on an, uh, a CPAP who went to one of those machines and she immediately had better results because I don't think they had titrated her uh, CPAP well enough, but she lost 40 pounds, you know, because she, her hunger hormones were more regulated and so on. You know, if you're not sleeping well, you, you tend to gain weight because those hunger hormones are all messed up. Oh, yeah. 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 So what I was looking at that looks very promising that does not change the relationship of the teeth with each other is something called the full breast solution. It's a lower splint that has a little paddle across, a little bar with a paddle across the back that kind of reaches back and pulls the tongue away from the airway. That looks very, very beneficial to me. And, you know, I've seen that it does get you know, results that it does help open the airway. And I kind of like that one, but you, know, you have all kinds of doctors invested in all kinds of different ways that they've learned to do. So again, you have to look at it and ask for what you want, what makes sense to you. Well, th well, thank you so much, Carol. That was so enlightening, and I just want to thank you so much for being on the show. And can you tell the listeners, you know, where they can find you and what you're up to these days? Oh, uh, yes. You can find me at uh, mouthmattersbook.com, and I have as much information as I have time to post up there. Also, Facebook under Mouth Matters or Carol Vanderstoop. 
have both a business and a personal page. They're kind of intermixed, so we go to either page. I do a lot of speaking engagements. In fact, um, I'm going to one at the Biomedic Conference where I'm going to encourage them to be getting into biological dentistry a little bit more. My main thing right now, though, is the book that I have called Mouth Matters, How Your Mouth Ages Your Body and What You Can Do About It. Because, again, there's so much there that I can't talk about in 10 radio interviews. And what a person can do is just read what most interests them and it'll lead them on rabbit trails that they might want to explore in more detail. I like the downloadable version, honestly, because it's uh, cheaper and the pictures are in color and it's searchable. I think that's very beneficial for people, but a lot of people like to have the paperback version. And so I have both. Well, yeah, I'm really glad that you wrote this book because it's one that I've actually been searching for for years to give any friend that I have with bad breath. Because, you know, you know, those friends you have, they have really bad breath and you just, you know, they just got to get their teeth cleaned or do some ozone therapy or something. So, and just being a good friend, I, you know, want to tell people uh, that, you know, they have bad breath. (laughs) But seriously, I've been telling people for years that they have to get their teeth cleaned if they want good breath and good health. So uh, thank you for writing this valuable resource that's, you know, an often overlooked aspect of health. Well, thank you for what you do, too. It's, uh, it's an uphill battle in this country to get the health information out there, and, uh, but it's still really important. There are sometimes I wonder why I do it, but basically because I can't help it. Yeah, <laughs> me, me too. Like, I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's fascinating. It's endlessly fascinating. So it was a pleasure, and thank you. Uh, listeners for listening in yeah and definitely i'd love to have you on the show again at some point in a few months talking about just myofascial therapy because it's really piqued my interest and i'd love to i think the listeners also i'd love to go a little bit more in depth on that subject with you i think we really should do that um, because it's worth i I know i did a two-hour interview with patrick tinponi not long ago and it got international attention so oh wow absolutely well thank you so much carol i really appreciate it Thank you. And thank you all the listeners out there for tuning in to the Live to 110 podcast. That's all for today. Talk to you soon.